And here we go again. You press play, and another podcast, another story, commences. And then it just happens. You can be driving, exercising, you can be savoring a swallow of wine. It doesn't really matter. So long as you can hear me and pay some attention, the rest seems effortless. You comprehend the sounds I make. Your mind's eye orchestrates the play for you. These words, these ephemeral little sculptures of breath, set the stage and all the actors in motion in barely a blink. 300 syllables a minute, in fact. That's how fast we comprehend the spoken word. The scaffolding of prepositions and conjunctions support the persons, places, and things of nouns whose form and substance are specified by adjectives and enlivened by the action of verbs. We are surely some species of magician, you and I, to conjure such worlds of meaning from air. But why these particular forms of air? Why these words? Colonialism certainly has something to do with the history of the English language's dominance, but that is not the only story. Another story centers on the English language itself. Linguistic experts assert the total number of distinct sounds in English to be at least 45, while most other languages offer less than 30. Of the thousands upon thousands of languages that have existed, none are as expansive as English, which offers tens of thousands of more words than even the richest runners-up, like German and Chinese, and twice as many words as more typical lexicons like French. This enables English speakers to express ideas in higher definition, as it were, capturing even the most minutely divergent contours of experience by recalling just the right synonym. Did you administer the event or manage the occasion? You might admit of wrongdoing but never confess a crime. Something could be awful, but not quite terrible, apparent, though not obvious, more bizarre than weird, and so on. English grammar is exceptionally supple, too. We can finagle pretty much any word to be any part of speech, making nouns into adjectives and adjectives into verbs. We can use the active or passive voice. We can move words around every which way to strike just the right emphasis. But even with all those extra words and available layers of meaning, English is still easier to learn than most other languages. There are around 375 million native English speakers in the world, but another 1,200 million have learned it, so that just over one and a half billion people can speak English. Barely over a billion people speak Chinese, less than 650 million speak Hindi, and Spanish speakers number only 420 million. English is the international language of business, science, politics, and entertainment. You want to be a pilot for a major national airline, for example? You'll need to speak English. It's the language of intercommunication among all 157 of them. So dominant is English today that we might assume it's been a key linguistic player forever. On the contrary, less than a thousand years ago, English was still a fragmented island language spoken by a few million farmers. Two thousand years ago, it didn't exist at all. So what happened? How did this once diminutive dialect of a backwater clan on the fringe of Europe come to define the expression of the modern world. I give you the English language and how it began. Several dozen people, numb with disbelief, 
stand immobile at the edge of their town as they gaze after the last of the receding Roman army. The year is 410 AD, and these forsaken locals are the so-called Celts of ancient Britain. Watching the weaponed crowd depart offers a little sense of liberation to the Celts. Whatever feeling does penetrate them must be more bitter than sweet, for although they had been subjugated by the Roman army here in their homeland of Britain for the past 400 years, the sheer duration of the occupation had made that army the only source of law and order they knew. And now it's disappearing at the steady pace of a soldier's march, and the abandoned Celts can only wonder at the anarchy to be left in its dust. It was the Romans who named this island Britannia, and ever since Julius Caesar initiated its invasion some 460 years earlier, in 55 BC, it had formed the extreme northwest boundary of the Roman Empire. Although violence and depression characterized the first several decades of Roman occupation, Ensuing generations of native Britons, such as the Celts, had come to accept a kind of peaceful imposition of Roman culture, bureaucracy, and military order. Throughout much of the southern half of the island of Britain, the Romans had, after all, established a reliable police force. They'd built roads and bathhouses. They'd installed running water and central heating in hundreds of buildings. And they'd cultivated widespread literacy. They'd civilized Britain, in other words, and over the centuries many Celts had come to identify as Roman themselves. For nearly 400 years, Britain was Rome. But then through the 300s AD, as the Roman Empire crumbled across Europe, Rome began to relinquish control of its borderland territories, including Britain, where military legions began departing as early as the 380s. And now, in the year 410, the last of the legions are evacuating the island. Britain is to be a part of Rome no more, and the Celts are ill-prepared to take over. In 410, Britain became a power vacuum. The population left behind consisted mostly of defenseless civilians spread among a score of self-appointed warlords. It was the dimmest moment of the Dark Ages. Like a black hole whose gravity is so powerful as to imprison light, history itself was held hostage to the chaos of anarchy in the years that followed leaving us scant evidence through nearly half a century of what life was really like and how bad things really got. We do know that the Celts were not able to self-organize effectively. We know they lacked the engineering skills and civic administration to expand or even maintain the Roman infrastructure of roads and bridges and running water. For almost as soon as the Roman leaders left, Many of these monuments to civilization either deteriorated or were swallowed up by nature in a tangle of vines and forests. It was surely a terrifying time. But no matter how bad things probably seemed, they were soon to get worse for the Celts. Barbarians were coming. Barbarians who had spent centuries rebelling against Roman rule rather than acquiescing to it and in the process, honing their military prowess to a level that would enable them to utterly dominate Britain upon their arrival. The first of them landed barely 40 years after the Romans left, around the year 450, and they would keep coming in wave after wave over the next several generations. And yet, as it turned out, they did not in fact come to conquer as the Romans originally had. They came to farm, to make a new life for themselves away from the chaos of their own homelands. They bullied their way into Britain, but their agenda once on the island was less of slaughter than of settlement. 
they came to plant crops. But since the Celts were so vulnerable, these immigrants ended up planting the seeds of an entirely new culture with an entirely new language to go with it. English. These waves of immigrants who arrived in Britain in the mid-400s had sailed from across the North Sea, from the northern shores of mainland Europe, where anarchy and infighting had likewise followed the departure of Roman forces. They represented a mix of closely related tribes, including the Jutes who hailed from modern-day Denmark, the Angles and Saxons from northern Germany, and the Frisians from the Netherlands. Historians refer to these people collectively as the Anglo-Saxons. The language spoken by the Anglo-Saxons was Germanic, which had been evolving over the centuries in the northwest part of the European continent, while the language of the Celts, more or less isolated as they had been on the island of Britain for nearly a thousand years, had distinctively diverged. The closest common linguistic ancestor between the immigrant Anglo-Saxons and the native Celts was thousands of years in the past, so by the time the languages collided once again in the mid-400s, there was little intelligible overlap left. Given the martial dominance of the Anglo-Saxons, the collision shattered the Celts. They were driven to the island's extreme north and west edges, to modern-day Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, and some even fled the islands altogether to resettle in Brittany on the northwest coast of modern-day France. They left little of their language with the Anglo-Saxons. A few place names endured, including the names of the rivers Avon and Thames. But beyond these trace vestiges, the language of the Anglo-Saxons completely subsumed the majority of Britain. And although it may look and sound completely foreign to our eyes and ears, its ancestry to what I am speaking now is evident enough to warrant the title Old English. Vada ura, thuthe eot en heofenum. Sithin nama ye hell god, tobacuma thin riche, ye wortha thin willa, on e orthan swa swa on heofenum. Urene adakwam liken laf, sila usta dag, and for yifas ure yiltas. Swa swa we for yifath urum yiltendam. And ne led thu us un kosnunge, akalusas of ufile, soth liche. This is Old English. Does the passage sound familiar? Fade ure, our father, thuthe eot on heofonum, who art in heaven, seeth in nama Yehelgod, hallowed be thy name. Old English certainly seems foreign to us upon first encounter, especially because of differences in pronunciation and word endings. But on closer inspection, there is a remarkable familiarity with modern English. Thorough linguistic and computer analysis has revealed that the 100 most common words in English are all Anglo-Saxon. Words at the center of our everyday lives. Words like man, wife, child, brother, sister, live, fight, love, drink, sleep, eat, work, wood and dog. The pronunciation and spelling of these words has evolved over the centuries, but they are very much recognizable in ancient texts. The workhorses of our syntax are also all present, prepositions like to, at, for, in, and on, and the conjunctions and, but, and or. These Anglo-Saxon words are still so fundamental to us that they will comprise at least half of the words in any passage of modern English. In total, there are about 4,500 Old English words left in modern English, compared to our full vocabulary of 450,000 words today. But Old English words remain in the body of our language as its very bones. The flesh and blood were adorned later.
In the year 597, by which time the Anglo-Saxons were well underway in establishing the oral traditions of the English language, a new kind of immigrant arrived in Britain who would initiate the language's literary history. This was a Christian missionary group headed by a man named Augustine, and along with their religious zeal, the missionaries brought Latin. Until Augustine's arrival, Old English was rarely written down. The only script available was a comparatively crude system of straight-lined etchings called runes that comprised a kind of runic alphabet used by the Anglo-Saxons for centuries to carve brief messages into wood and stone. With Latin, on the other hand, monks were writing entire books, hymns, poetry, epics, and as Augustine and his fellow missionaries spread the Christian faith among the Anglo-Saxons, so too did they spread the Latin system of writing. The budding beauty of the Old English spoken word, its poetry and legends that had previously propagated through oral tradition alone, could now be put on the page, transcribed through the Latin alphabet sound by sound or fully translated into the Latin language. And when there was a word or any other utterance of Old English thought that the Christian monks struggled to translate, they would simply use a Latin word to fill in the gap. And as the years rolled by, this practice caused thousands of Latin words to be grafted onto the English language, first in print, then in everyday speech, initiating one of the most important historical features of English that would power its rise to world dominance, absorbing other languages. As early as the year 731, this was observed by a Christian monk named Venerable Bede, who achieved fame as the first known historian of the English-speaking people. In his book, he highlighted the emerging strength of English to express ideas alternatively through the straightforward, heavy-hitting vernacular of Anglo-Saxon or through the more expressive, often poetic, Latin-infused style. The recipe of English was clearly simmering now, but more ingredients were soon to come. Through the 600s and 700s, life among the Anglo-Saxons of Britain seemed to settle into a relatively peaceful rhythm for a change. Old English flowered, heavily fertilized as it was with Latin. But the peace didn't last long. Unfortunately for the Anglo-Saxons, a kind of historical karma soon came calling. Just as they had smashed their way onto the British Isles and sent the Celts running for the hills in the late 400s, the Vikings began making furious landfall in Britain in the late 700s to send the Anglo-Saxons fleeing in turn. Ultimately, the Vikings were motivated to invade for the same reasons that the Anglo-Saxons had been, to find new land to settle. And they came from a similar region, Northern Europe. All that really separated the two groups then was time, some three centuries of independent cultural and linguistic development. Not so much that they couldn't understand each other, in fact. They didn't speak different languages, they spoke different dialects of the same language. They used a lot of different words, their word endings were different, and they had somewhat dissimilar sentence structure. But if an Anglo-Saxon and a Viking found themselves trapped in a room together and somehow agreed not to fight, they would have been able to have a pretty meaningful conversation and might have even discovered that their ancestral stories overlapped. But true to their rapacious reputation, Vikings weren't interested in talking, they were interested in taking. Taking land, taking women and slaves, taking estates. The only thing that would stop them was force. And after almost a hundred years of Viking domination between 793 and 878, the Anglo-Saxons finally mounted an effective resistance. Thereafter, the two sides established a peaceful division of England, in which the Vikings controlled the northeast half 
and the Anglo-Saxons controlled the southwest half. But the border between the two proved highly porous. Once the fighting stopped, both sides recognized their similarities and began to intermingle. They did business with each other, they intermarried. And with all that talking finally taking place between them, the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings naturally began to smooth out the rough linguistic edges that separated their dialects. For example, take a simple verb like to judge or to deem, as in she deems him worthy. The Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings shared a very similar root verb for this, but their verb endings to describe who was doing the deeming, I deem, you deem, she deems, and so on, those endings differed. In Anglo-Saxon, the verb conjugation sounded something like deme, demest, demeth. In Viking, it sounded like domi, domir, domir. The mingled people simply started to slough off most of the verb endings, with new generations converging on the same pronunciation of I deem, you deem, she deemeth. This sort of grammatical sanding down of the shared dialect of the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings helped to simplify the English language, making it much easier to learn. Meanwhile, the two groups essentially fused their vocabulary, contributing thousands of new Scandinavian-derived words to English, including skull, crawl, scream, trust, take, sky, husband, freckle, rotten, and skill. Now we were beginning to amass the repertoire of synonyms for which English is renowned. For these Viking words did not replace similar Anglo-Saxon words, but complemented them. So we ended up with the synonyms craft and skill, for example, along with wish and want, raise and rear, and so on. By the year 1000, English was already one of the most dynamic languages in Europe. If you traveled back in time and attempted a conversation with someone, you'd certainly struggle given how different the pronunciation and grammar still was from what we know today. But after a few days, you would start to get used to it. The language would feel familiar, and you'd recognize hundreds of words. Nothing like a totally foreign language that would take months or years of study to master. Still, the English language had a long way to go before resembling its modern form. And yet another invasion of Britain was about to catapult English from the age of Beowulf to the age of Chaucer. In the year 1066, the descendants of a different group of Vikings who had settled in modern-day France, known as the Normans, invaded Britain. This was the infamous Norman invasion, through which the ruler of Normandy and France, William the Conqueror, seized the English throne and incorporated England into his expansive French kingdom. It was a historical echo of the Roman occupation a thousand years earlier. The French-speaking Normans now occupied and controlled England, usurping practically all English positions of authority and aristocracy. In the wake of the invasion, the ruling class of England spoke French. It would be 300 years, in fact, before another English-speaking king ruled England. This, of course, had a profound effect on the development of the English language. One of the most pronounced, so to speak, was a massive infusion of military, aristocratic, administrative, and legal vocabulary into English, which makes sense given that the new rulers monopolized those echelons of society. Words like army, archer, soldier, and guard, parliament, govern, prince, and duke, sovereign, marriage, damage, and petty, justice, jury, traitor, and felony were among some of the 10,000 or so French-derived words injected into English. And just like the earlier Viking infusion of vocabulary, 
The new words did not displace existing English words, but complemented them in ever-expanding webs of connotation. English speakers could now talk of motherhood or maternity, brotherhood or fraternity, friendship or amity. They could make distinctions between the livestock of cows, sheep, and pigs, and the foods of beef, mutton, and bacon. In the years following the Norman invasion, no more than 10% of the population of England was ever native French-speaking, but their position at the top of English society disproportionately affected the region's language, not only in vocabulary, but also in furthering grammatical simplification. New generations of aristocratic Normans who grew up in a majority English-speaking society served only to accelerate what the Anglo-Saxon Viking collision had initiated centuries earlier. More English word endings were peeled off and replaced by utilitarian prepositions like to, at, by, and from. Plurals were increasingly formed simply by adding an s at the end of nouns. Gendered nouns were purged entirely. In this cauldron of coalescing speech, English was distilled into a much more modern-looking form, settling into ever smoother grammatical grooves, even as its expressive power multiplied. The dramatic development of English under French rule was fully revealed in the 1300s, when English control over England was finally reasserted. There were two main historical forces that helped to overturn the French occupation. First, factions within the French kingdom began fighting amongst each other beginning in the early 1200s, and this ultimately cut off the French rulers in England from their cultural center on mainland Europe. Their isolation only intensified as these dynastic conflicts culminated in an all-out hundred years war between the English and the French from 1337 to 1454, during which time fierce anti-French sentiment settled over the island. Second, the Black Death of the 1350s killed off countless members of the clergy, the military, the royal administration, and the urban elite of England, in which a disproportionate fraction of people were of upper-class French descent. This effectively cleaned out the ranks of power in England and opened the way for native English speakers to once again seize control. In 1362, the English courts declared English to be the official language of procedure since not enough French or Latin-speaking magistrates and lawyers were left alive in the wake of the plague. And in that same year, Parliament opened in English at Westminster for the first time. Then in 1399, the first English-speaking king since the Norman invasion of 1066 was crowned, King Henry IV. With the official return of English to the halls of power, every English utterance from parliamentary debate to the king's speech was avidly recorded for posterity once more, and this helps clarify for historians just how far English had come in the three preceding centuries. Whereas an untrained modern English reader could not decipher the Old English text of Beowulf, written around the year 1000, they probably could make out most of Henry IV's coronation speech of 1399. But perhaps an even better demonstration of the language's advancement can be found in the poetic literature of Geoffrey Chaucer, who captured that season's bloom of English best in his magnificent Canterbury Tales, written in 1387. One that April with his sure sota, the drocht of March hath persed to the rota, and bathed every vein in swish locur, of which virtu engendred is the flu. The opening lines of Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And although they may at first seem poetically dense, we can clearly understand their meaning. Chaucer is rejoicing in the return of spring 
and the blossom begotten by April showers. But there's more historical import here. The reason why we remember Chaucer, the reason you're probably familiar with his name even if you've never read Canterbury Tales, is because Chaucer demonstrated the beautiful power of the English language in an age when almost everyone else believed that real literature was written in Latin or French. His writing is wonderful, but his legacy was to inspire a new age of confidence in the artistic potential of the English language. His work embodied the exceptional cosmopolitanism of English, Words derived from French, Scandinavian, Latin, and Anglo-Saxon all joined together in the tapestry of his stories to bring his characters to life in a way that no other literature had ever done. And this set the stage for the greatest English poet and playwright of all time, William Shakespeare. When Shakespeare was born in 1564, England was still a relatively weak nation. When he died 52 years later in 1616, however, England was one of the most powerful countries in Europe. His life largely overlapped with the reign of Queen Elizabeth, who did much to liberalize England and reorganize its geopolitical strength around the navy and merchant marine which together significantly broadened the intellectual and cultural horizons of the English people. New worlds were being discovered across the oceans of the globe. New treasures, new foods, new knowledge, and new people were being brought back to England to ignite still greater ambition for discovery. The English language's long history of coevolution with foreign influence perfectly primed its best writers to bring Chaucer's legacy to fruition, and none was better than William Shakespeare. He captured the innovative spirit of the age, wholly inventing some 2,000 words and phrases to revolutionize the expression of human experience. He gave us the words accessible and birthplace, bloodstained and courtship, domineering, eyeball, fashionable, generous, hostile, invitation, jaded, leapfrog, moonbeam, noiseless, obscene, priceless, quarrelsome, radiance, shipwrecked, transcendence, unreal, vulnerable, and watchdog. He coined the phrases, as luck would have it, bated breath, brave new world, cold comfort, as dead as a doornail, eaten out of house and home, for goodness sake, good riddance, heart of gold, in my mind's eye, laughing stock, one fell swoop, wear my heart on my sleeve, and wild goose chase. The verbal architecture for thousands of our thoughts was provided by this man. Dozens of other writers certainly contributed too, but it was Shakespeare who drove the English language through its modern adolescence. Over the next 250 years, more than 10 million people emigrated from the British Isles in search of new opportunities, bringing their English language with them to the farthest reaches of the world. Around half settled in what would become the United States of America. There, the spirit of the new modern age found one of its greatest expressions in the Declaration of Independence, written in perfectly recognizable modern English now in the year 1776. As one of its signatories, John Adams, wrote soon after, English is destined to be in the next and succeeding generations more generally the language of the world. The reason for this is obvious, he went on, because the increasing population in America and their universal connection and correspondence with all nations will, aided by the influence of England in the world, whether great or small, force their language into general use. Indeed, while the United States has a reputation as a melting pot, until about 1840, immigrants to America were almost exclusively British, with the only other large group of arrivals being African slaves. The English language was therefore deeply rooted in American culture by the time mass immigration finally picked up in the second half of the 1800s. 
Between 1860 and 1905, over 30 million immigrants from all over Europe arrived speaking a dozen different languages. But although some feared that America would fragment into a kind of new Europe with different language regions, a primary part of the immigrant experience was an enthusiastic study of English. Nationalism and bigotry played a part in compelling English adoption, but it's also clear that millions of immigrants relished in the new social, economic, cultural, and expressive power that came with English proficiency, and they spent their money accordingly. For decades, for example, Webster's Dictionary of American English was the second best-selling book in the country only to the Bible. Instead of fragmenting, Americans actually spoke an even more uniform version of English than the British themselves, due in part to the exceptional popularity of Webster's spelling bees that emphasized clear articulation of every syllable as part of the contest. The English language had been born of immigration 1,500 years earlier, but it had been the immigration of Germanic tribes into a land of anarchy and Roman ruin. Now, the English language was flourishing in a new era of immigration, this time into a land of unprecedented progress. In the 21st century, the English language continues to evolve and at an ever-accelerating rate. Its greatest historical strengths, adaptability and flexibility, are serving us supremely well in the modern age of incessant, rapid change. English continues to expand and diversify faster than any other language, incorporating some 20,000 new words each year. The very moment when a new English dictionary is printed, it is outdated. Even so, no other language has produced anything close to the body of English dictionaries with its vast etymological history, especially compared to the Oxford English Dictionary, which now contains 615,000 individual word form definitions and illustrations. From these documents alone, we know more about the history of English than about the history of any other language. What we learn is that English has not only empowered its speakers to express some of the most innovative ideas in history, but that the language itself is the most innovative language in history. So far, that has proven to be its greatest gift to us. But it's also been a complicated gift, which can, from time to time, produce an inflation of language that erodes meaning. The late comedian George Carlin did a way better job than I ever could explaining this in his sketch on euphemisms with the example of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so, let's share a laugh and end with him. I'll give you an example of that. There's a condition in combat, most people know about it, it's when a fighting person's nervous system has been stressed to its absolute peak and maximum, can't take any more input. The nervous system has either snapped or is about to snap. In the First World War, that condition was called shell shock. Simple, honest, direct language, two syllables, shell shock. Almost sounds like the guns themselves. That was 70 years ago. Then a whole generation went by, and the Second World War came along, and we, the very same combat condition was called battle fatigue. Four syllables now. Takes a little longer to say. Doesn't seem to hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Shell shock. Battle fatigue. Then we had the war in Korea, 1950. Madison Avenue was riding high by that time. And the very same combat condition was called operational exhaustion. <laughs> hey, we're up to eight syllables now. And the humanity has been squeezed completely out of the phrase. It's totally sterile now. Operational exhaustion. Sounds like something that might happen to your car. 
Then, of course, came the war in Vietnam, which has only been over for about 16 or 17 years. And thanks to the lies and deceit surrounding that war, I guess it's no surprise that the very same condition was called post-traumatic stress disorder. Still eight syllables, but we've added a hyphen. And the pain is completely buried under jargon. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I'll bet you, if we'd have still been calling it shell shock, some of those Vietnam veterans might have gotten the attention they needed at the time. I'll bet you.